Today we're going to look at one of my favorite types of problems involving limits. And those are the types of problems that jump towards integrals using the Riemann sum definition of an integral. Okay, so anyway, let's see what we have here. Oh, and by the way, this is from the 1997 International Math Competition. This is a math competition for university students. So let's suppose that we have a sequence A sub n, and it's any sequence as long as it satisfies two conditions. First of all, it has positive numbers, and second of all, its limit is zero. And then our goal is to find the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n, times the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of k over n plus a sub n. And any time you have a limit that has a one over n term and then a sum with n terms, you probably wanna transform that into an integral using a limit of a Riemann sum definition. Okay, but the difference here is that we have a number a n which is like tweaking this to be slightly away from an integral that we can write down. That being said, I think we can maybe still use that strategy, especially if we use the following observation, which I'll prove. And that is, as long as a is a positive real number, the integral from a to one plus a of the natural log of x dx can be written as the following Riemann sum. So it'll be the limit as n goes to infinity of delta x times the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of x sub k. Of course, that's just the straight definition. Now what we need to do is find delta x in our setup and, well, x, k in our setup. So let's recall that delta x is equal to b minus a over n. So I'm using maybe traditional notation where a is the lower bound of integration and b is the upper bound of integration. So in this case, the role of b is being played by one plus a. So if we do one plus a minus a, we get one, and then we'll have just one over n for delta x. And then let's also recall from the standard way of doing limits of Riemann sums, x sub k will be a plus k times delta x. And the way I like to think about this is you start at a and you take k steps. Each one of those steps is delta x units long. And that helps you like break up your interval from a to b into those pieces. Okay, so now we can write this down. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, and then we'll have the sum as k goes from 1 to n of the natural log of k over n plus a. Because that's what we have here. We have a plus k times delta x, but that's exactly that. Okay, so now let's bring that over here because it's gonna get a lot of use. So let's notice for a bigger than zero, we have the integral from a to one plus a, and really this is a bigger than or equal to zero. There's no, nothing special with a being, <clears throat> there's nothing special with, there's nothing special with a being positive there. It can't be negative because that's outside of the domain of the natural log. Okay, so anyway, the natural log of x dx is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n, and then we'll have the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of k over n plus a. So that's what we have here. But notice this is a fixed a but this is a variable a here, this a sub n, that's a term of a sequence, and that's gonna change for every term of this sum. That's what makes this kind of sticky. That being said, with this observation, I think we're in good shape. So let's get started with the final solution. And the idea will be to bound this thing right here between two things that look very, very similar, but where this a n has been replaced with a constant. And thus we'll be able to use this rule right here. Okay, so how might we do that? 
Well, let's use the fact that a n is positive and its limit is zero. And also we'll use the epsilon n definition of a limit. Okay, so let's say given epsilon bigger than zero, let's take a capital N, which is a natural number, such that if little n is bigger than or equal to capital N, then we have a sub n is less than epsilon, but it's always bigger than zero. So we have something like that going on. But now, since the natural log function is increasing, let's also notice that for k between one and n, we have the following. So our thing over here, so this natural log of k over n plus a sub n will be less than the natural log of k over n plus epsilon. Again, because the natural log function is an increasing function and we put something larger in its argument, but it's gonna be bigger than the natural log of just k over n. Again, because the natural log function is argument. Again, because the natural log function is increasing. And we get this just from maybe adding k over n to each part of this inequality. Okay, but now we'll sum this after multiplying by one over n, and we're kind of almost there. So let's do that. So now we have the sum as k goes from one to n of one over n times the natural log of k over n is gonna be less than the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of k over n plus a sub n, which in turn is less than one over n times the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of k over n plus epsilon. Okay, so that's where we're at. And now we're gonna take the limit of all parts of this. So we'll take the limit of the two outside pieces using this observation that we proved. So let's write that down first. So this limit over here using the observation is exactly the integral from zero to one of the natural log of x dx. And then I'll go ahead and put that what we have in the middle here is the limit as n goes to infinity of, well, exactly what I get when I bring this down. I realize I just forgot a one over n there. So we've got one over n, the sum as k goes from one to n of the natural log of k over n plus a sub n. So that's what I'll call our, our goal limit. And then what do we have over there? Well, let's use our observation again, but now the role of a is being played by epsilon. So this is gonna be less than or equal to the integral from epsilon to one plus epsilon of the natural log of x dx. But now let's notice that this down here is true for any epsilon bigger than zero. So you might say, well, where did we use this capital N? Well, when we're taking this limit here as N goes to infinity, well, eventually we get past that capital N, so we're good to go. But like I started with, since this is true for any epsilon bigger than zero, that means that it's true when we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So if we let epsilon go to zero over there, this collapses to the integral from zero to one of the natural log of x dx. So what we've done is we've sandwiched our goal limit between two copies of the exact same thing. But that means that this must be equal to that integral from zero to one of natural log of x dx. And now all that's left is to evaluate that integral, which is what we'll do. All right, this is where we left off. Our goal limit is simply the integral from zero to one of natural log of x. But notice this is an improper integral. That's because natural log has a discontinuity at zero. It approaches negative infinity as we come from zero, as we go towards zero from above. So that means we need to set this up as a limit itself. So this is equal to the limit as t goes to zero from above of the integral from t to one of the natural log of x dx. But now we've got an integral which itself is like actually a little bit tricky. So it's an, an integral of an inverse function and anytime you see an integral of an inverse function, you should be thinking that you use integration by parts. That's the classic way of deriving integrals of inverse functions. So let's do that. 
let's set u equal to simply the natural log of x, and we'll set dv equal to dx. So this makes du equal to 1 over x dx, and this makes v equal to x. So there we've got our setup for integration by parts. And then let's also recall the integration by parts formula. The integral of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. So I awkwardly squeezed that in, but I think that's okay. So in our setting, we have this limit as t goes to zero from above, and then we'll have u times v. So u times v in this case will be natural log of x times x. So we've got x, natural log of x, evaluated from t up to 1, and then minus the integral of v du. But let's notice that v du will cancel down to 1, so we get minus the integral from t to 1 dt. Okay, nice. But now we'll notice that the but now we'll notice if we plug in one, natural log of one is zero, and so that leaves us with the limit, but that leaves us with the limit involving t. So we have the limit as t goes to zero from above of negative t times the natural log of t because, in, because it's in the lower bound, and then this will be minus one plus t from integrating that bit. And now I'm going to leave a little step for you, and that is to show that this object right here, this minus t times the natural log of t, in fact turns into zero, as we take the limit, of course. And then this t term will obviously go to zero as well, leaving us a final answer of negative one. And so there we have it. We found the final value of this limit. It's just negative one, and that's a good place to stop.